August of 2009, I woke up and I had this weird sensation in my left hand. That got my attention to the point that I made an appointment with a cardiologist. I went in to have my blood checked, and that's when um, I discovered that my cholesterol was 494 and my triglycerides were 3,295. And, and he said, we need to do an arteriogram. And I just assumed I was going to have some stents, and that was going to be the end of it. And I had 85% blockage of my left anterior descending, and 80% a little further downstream, and a 70 of my right main coronary. I had another artery that was 100% blocked. I literally was scheduled for a triple bypass that Friday. Never in a million years did that cross my mind that my husband at that age would need open heart surgery. I literally read Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Dr. Esselstyn in one day, and I called my cardiologist and said, I'm not having surgery. It's radically changed my view of food and what I view as healthy and unhealthy. I tell people all the time, I did not quit eating meat because it did not taste good. I quit eating meat because it was going to kill me. If I can make the change, being such a dyed-in-the-wool carnivore that I was, anybody can make the change. There's, there's something I've been dying to ask you about. Um, uh, I saw a video that you did. You went way out on a limb, said something that I was not familiar with about the connection between diet and common orthopedic diseases. Well, yeah, there's no question that most of what we deal with from a musculoskeletal standpoint is diet related. I've studied nutrition more than I've studied orthopedics. And then since I retired, uh, I study nutrition every day. I mean, I'm reading something all the time wow. about nutrition. Um, and the research in nutrition is so all over the board, it's very easy to get confused. And uh, some, you know, some of it is intentional. And I call those guys confusionists. I follow a doctor, um, his name's Peter Atia, and his advice on nutrition is horrible. I agree. <laughs> but he has some great advice on exercise. The guy that I probably agree with most right now is... Welcome to the Crisco & Company podcast. I'm your host, Lee Crisco, MD. Today, our guest is Dr. Jimmy Conway. He's a retired orthopedic surgeon from Oklahoma who had the life-saving good fortune of stumbling into a whole food plant-based diet exactly when he needed it most. He was featured in the documentary films, Eating You Alive and, Dis and Disease Reversal Hope. Joyce and I just rewatched uh, those movies a few days ago, and we reached out to Jimmy and graciously said he'd be a guest on our podcast. Welcome to our podcast. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah, well, we really appreciate it. Um, now, t tell us, what happened? How did you, as a meat-eating Oklahoman, stumble, stumble into a whole food plant-based diet? Well, um, yes, Oklahoma is basically the center of uh, meat-eating, <laughs> center of the universe, I think. Uh, so in 2009, you know, I was in my usual state of denial uh, about my health, and I awoken, I woke up one August, it was August of 2009, and I had a strange sensation in my left hand. You know, the joke in medicine is the definition of a double-blind study is two orthopedic <laughs> surgeons looking at an EKG. There's a lot of truth to that. Uh, I know if there's no squiggly lines, it's bad, but that's about all I knew about EKGs. But I also knew that left uh, upper extremity pain could be referred from the heart, so I thought, this was a weird feeling. It wasn't like any of my pains that I've had from football. So I played college football and had significant neck trauma. Uh, and so I've had a neck fusion. And I always said, used to say, if I ever had left hand pain like I have right hand pain, I'd be afraid I was having a heart attack. Well, I woke up and I had this strange sensation in my left hand and I realized that it wasn't anything that I felt was musculoskeletal. So I thought it was referred. And so I thought, well, I better get things checked out. I'd not had a, a 
physical in years. Uh, I basically didn't have a primary care physician. So, you know, I was kind of like sideline consults with my primary care colleagues, like for blood pressure or whatever. But I really wasn't, um, didn't have a good uh, medical treatment program going on. So I um, called up a cardiologist who was not a friend. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that's my current cardiologist, but at the time um, I thought I would try somebody I didn't know. So I saw this cardiologist and he promptly drew lab. My cholesterol was 494 and my triglycerides were 3,295. Yikes. He said I, he'd never seen triglycerides that high. Now, I do have a family history of high triglycerides, but that was a little bit excessive, even for my family. Uh, so we said, you know, we need to do a stress test. So I promptly flunked the stress test. And so he said I needed an arteriogram. And so I went into this test um, really kind of brain dead about the consequences of it, thinking that I would have maybe a stint or two and be no big deal, no big change. I'd go on and continue doing life the way I always had done it. And I woke up from that uh, procedure with the cardiovascular surgeon standing over my stretcher. So I knew that wasn't a good sign. I had the procedure done on a Monday. Um, I was scheduled for a triple bypass that Friday. Uh, wow. I had 85% blockage in my left hand tear descending, 80% a little further downstream, 70 in my right main coronary. I had another that was 100% blocked, but I'd re collateralized around it. Mm-hmm. And so they basically said you need to have a triple bypass. Mm-hmm. And the Friday before this procedure, my wife ran into a partner of mine who said, oh, you need to get him to read the book, The China Study. So mm-hmm. that weekend before I had this test, I read the book, The China Study. And um, first time I'd ever heard any information about reversing heart disease. And really the first time I'd heard information about actually what causes the heart disease. Um, you know, I grew up with a belief that uh, my future was mapped out by my genes, genetic determinism. Um, and we have very strong family history of heart disease. Just about my dad came from a fairly large family of 10 children. Uh, most everybody passed of heart disease or a stroke. Uh, my grandparents, my paternal grandfather died of a heart attack in the, in his seventies. My maternal grandfather died of a heart attack at the age of 52. Um, So strong family history of heart disease, thinking that one, it was inevitable that I was going to get heart disease and not really buying into the notion that I am what I eat, even though I would say that Mm -hmm. I didn't really buy it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, starting from basically no knowledge and starting with the China study. And then in that book, as as mentioned, a book called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. And so um, I had my arteriogram through my groin. So that Tuesday I was off work. Um, So I went to a bookstore, a local bookstore, and found uh, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease and literally read that in a day. Mm -hmm. and called my cardiologist and said, I'm not having this. I'm going to try this whole food plant-based. So literally, we went from eating everything that is standard about the standard American diet and eating a lot of it. I've been a food addict my whole life. And um, I mean, don't look at now. I weigh about 100 and I don't know, a little less than 160. Um, but the most I ever weighed was 226. And when I woke up with that arm pain, I was about 205, I think. I dropped a little weight, but it was all by accident. It wasn't intentional. Um, <clears throat> I, actually, what had happened is I'd had a ruptured diverticulum. 
had uh, to have emergency surgery and colostomy. And ooh. Uh, so I lost a lot of weight going through that. And I just recovered enough that I was back up to like 205 or so. At five foot 10, I was obese. Um, and so we started literally one day, we went completely whole food plant-based. We went to the grocery store. I vividly recall our first trip to the grocery store after deciding to go down this path. And it probably took us three hours uh, to read the labels and, you know, avoid any oil or um, added salt, sugar, and fat. And uh, now, you know, it's second nature. And we basically, I don't buy many canned objects. So I don't have to read the labels. Uh, it's mainly fresh produce. Um, but that started our foray into whole food plant-based. And I mean, literally, it was one day uh, bad diet, next day totally strict whole food plant-based. The hardest part was the salt uh, because I, I've always loved to salt my food. And, you know, not adding salt to the food. It took a lot of um, getting used to, to get used to eating like that. We don't salt our food when we cook it. Now, we might add a little bit afterwards, but um, salting the food while you cook it is just a great way of adding a lot of salt right. to your diet. Yeah. And so after two years, I'd started... Um, wanting to know more of the science. Mm -hmm. Also, we went out to Torrey Pine State Park in California and I hiked that park two days in a row. And I basically couldn't walk for a week after that because of knee issues. So I decided at that time to have a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. And so in, in 2011, I had a right total knee replacement and then I started uh, trying to get back into some semblance of shape. Um, I tore my ACL and lateral meniscus when I was a sophomore in college, returning a kickoff. And then two years after that, I re-injured my knee and had an osteochondral fracture in my lateral femoral condyle. And within a couple of years of that, I needed a knee replacement. So, you know, I'm in my 20s. I can't, I can't run. And I actually ran track in college as well, played college football. So running was was my stress relief. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, uh, I had to quit basically all forms of that type of exercise, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I made it from that age to 52 when I had my knee replaced. Um, by periodically having arthroscopies and kind of having it washed out and then injected with PRP and um, hyaluronic acid. I can't tell you how many times I've had that, those injections. <clears throat> so after I had my knee replaced and started um, really looking at the science behind how this actually worked, so I did the Cornell online nutrition course with T. Colin Campbell. Um, and I actually went and met with Dr. Esselstyn in Cleveland. Oh, wow. um, and so um, to, it was like two months after I had my knee replaced, I went to Cleveland um, and met with Dr. Esselstyn. And since that time, we've communicated uh, I was very strict uh, SC disciple for uh, a number of years. But then as I got to reading the science, some of the Esselstyn um, stance on like nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. I thought were uh, a little bit excessive. And we actually have discussed this. And his position was when he started his study back in the 1980s, there was not much information on whether or not seeds and nuts were healthy. And there was a lot of information that they were uh, very high in fat. And so his premise was fat was the, the culprit. So he didn't want you eating anything but um, some flaxseed. 
mm-hmm. is what he would allow. There, you know, there's certainly different opinions on that. Uh, like the Adventist 2 study showed a clear reduction in cardiac mortality if you eat a little bit of nuts. Um, but that's not necessarily a population that actually has heart disease. So, right. <laughs> so, so, so what do you do? All these little caveats. But, um, so basically, beginning with that Cornell course in 2011, I've studied nutrition more than I've studied orthopedics. And then since I retired, uh, I study nutrition every day. I mean, I'm reading something all the time wow. about nutrition. And my goal recently was to really try to see what is actually healthy mm-hmm. versus some type of dogma. Mm-hmm. Um, and the research in nutrition is so all over the board, it's very easy to get confused. And uh, some, you know, some of it is intentional. And I call those guys confusionists. Mm-hmm. So there are some definite um, scientists, I use that word loosely, who publish material in essence to confuse us is my opinion mm-hmm. um so it's hard to to uh to you know get through all that literature and try and determine what's valid and what's not mm-hmm. so you know i in, inevitably i follow various people in the whole food plant-based field an influencer from australia named simon hill and oh, yeah. Simon is yeah. a, a nutritionist and has, um, I think he has a background in physical medicine. Yes. Uh, but to me, he has the best information without dogma. Yeah, he's very, very evidence driven. Very evidence driven. Um, I, I follow a doctor, um, his name's Peter Atia, and mm-hmm. His advice on nutrition is horrible. I agree. <laughs> but he has some great advice on exercise. Mm-hmm. And I know that he has a mental block when it comes to nutrition research because he's mm-hmm. a brilliant mind. Mm-hmm. But he is just so much in a state of denial. Mm-hmm. Um, he, is, he basically says in his book that you have to eat meat to build muscle. Yeah, it's just not true. No, it's not true at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I follow a a guy from the Dallas Fort Worth area that's a vegan bodybuilder, mm-hmm. um, and basically he eats lentils and chickpeas, mm-hmm. and those are real high in protein. And even Simon says that you know the the recommendation on protein intake of 0.8 grams per kilogram is I don't think adequate as we get older. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I've kind of increased protein intake some. I'm 68 years old. And so, you know, after the age of about 65, we need a little bit higher protein. And I have started trying to build muscle. Just, and I got the idea uh, from Peter Atia. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. in that he has this thing he calls the centenarian decathlon. Um, but as we age, we need to keep in mind that the last decade of our life is where we really go downhill really fast. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to build up my reserve. Mm-hmm. So when I hit that last, I'll have enough and I won't be invalid. Right. And so that's right. the whole, that's our goal right now at mm-hmm. this stage in life is to yeah. be active enough to prevent uh, me becoming an in, invalid. Yeah, I, we, what we've done, I mean, I've always lifted weights for years, but I've gone back to lifting sort of moderately heavy, challenging weights with the specific goal of getting stronger. Right. Because the thing that is going to put you in the old folks home isn't your inability to run a marathon. It's your inability to, you know, get up from a chair. Get up out of the chair pick up your groceries, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, Joyce and I are really focusing on very basic movements, you know, squatting down, picking things up, putting things overhead. Um, And I, uh, I've been doing this since late summer and I've gained about 14 pounds, probably most of it's muscle, uh, much stronger. And there's a guy on YouTube I follow, um, this young guy from Ireland named Clarence Kennedy. 
and he's an Olympic weightlifter um, who he does not compete, but he uh, actually is within like four or two kilograms of the world record on the total for the hundred, you know, hundred kilogram. Uh, and he's pure vegan, pure vegan. And I watched, uh, you know, what I eat in a day thing with him. And it was very similar to what we eat really. But I, every once in a while I go on chronometer and track my protein and um, it uh, has me aiming for, I think about 120 grams a day. Some days I actually don't hit that target but I know I'm still getting stronger. Right. So it may be, I don't quite need that. Some days I blow right past it, but um, uh, it may be, I don't quite need as much as they say, because clearly I'm getting you know stronger. Well, and it, that's, uh, that's most, my goal was to get stronger, not necessarily bulk up. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, being retired, I got to do a deep dive on muscle building and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm this whole protein thing in my mind, I don't think we really have protein requirements as much as we have specific amino acid requirements. Yeah. And the specific amino acids, the you know, leucine seems to be a neurotransmitter type mm -hmm. molecule that uh, we have to have a certain amount to start muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. You know, the guys that really get into the science of muscle protein synthesis, those are the guys that seem to basically state you got to have muscle, you got to have meat to build muscle. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a circulating amino acid pool. And I know uh, last year I did an eight day water only fast and I lost weight the first three days. I did not do it to lose weight. I did it to see if I could actually do it because I'm so afraid of being hungry because mm -hmm. of past experiences. Um, and I'm convinced that my hunger is a mental game. It's a habit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm always testing, okay, am I really hungry or am I just craving something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? I have this area in my brain where it remembers food tastes very, very, very well. Mm. <laughs> and so if food is really reinforcing, it's not satiating. Mm. And that's what causes us to overeat. And mm. I think our main problem, uh, I, 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 there's no question that whole food plant-based is the healthiest for humans. Mm. But our main problem in the United States is we eat too many calories. Right. And our caloric intake has gone up so much. It exactly, and it only takes about 300 extra calories a day to tip you into metabolic disease. Right. And we easily eat over 300 calories a day in excess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as an average. Yeah. Um, and that's why we're fat, sick, and nearly dead. That's why right. I was fat, sick, and nearly dead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go back 100 years, the amount of oil people consumed in a, oh, a yeah. year was like three pounds or something. But now it's over 70. Right. And same sort of tra trends with, you know, white flour and 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 meat and right. uh, and sugar. And it's really not a mystery that we've all gotten <laughs> no. bigger. No, it's. You know, and the, the myth that's out there is, you know, they changed our food recommendations in the 80s. And so they started recommending all this low fat. And we went from low fat to high carb, high mm -hmm. processed carb, which we did go to high processed carb. But we never have dropped our fat intake. We mm -hmm. eat more fat today than we've ever eaten. Right. And, you know, when I was doing my seminars, I would have these sayings to get people's attention. And one of them is the effing F's of nutrition. It's not what you're thinking. It's fantastic facts, fabulous food. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of them was the fat you eat, the fat you wear. Well, that's not right. Quite true. Mm -hmm. Because there's some fat you can eat. That's actually not harmful. And it's probably good for you. There are some fats that we actually require. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems to be that what we really need to steer away from are saturated fats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And probably trans fats too. 
Well, yeah, no question about trans fats. What are your thoughts on on the omega fats? Since we're talking about fats, um, there's differing opinions on whether or not, as somebody that's entirely whole food plant based, whether or not we should supplement with the longer chain fatty acids, you know, the DHA and EPA. Um, they'll say, well, if you're eating lots of, you know, um, walnuts and chia seeds and that sort of thing, you can synthesize those longer chains. Do you think that that's true or do we need to take a supplement? Well, one, I don't think we can synthesize from ALA, the EPA and DHA, uh, real efficiently. Mm -hmm. And that uh, efficiency goes down as we age. But the only thing I've been able to determine from looking at the studies on taking omega-3s is it increases your risk of uh, atrial fibrillation without any clear-cut evidence that it works for longevity. Hmm. Now, I have at, on time, I have taken omega-3s. Uh, when we take it, it's from algae. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think you can decontaminate the fish. So, right. Even yeah. though they claim to have decontaminated fish oil, yeah, I just you, think stick with the primary source. You you can get the heavy metals out, but you can't get the organic pollutants out. So that's why we do the same thing. We take the algae based. Um, we've been taking a low dose algae based for a while. Uh, Dr. Furman. Uh, is a big fan of, of doing that. Um, so we've been taking a little bit. I mean, I still have some concerns, you know, it's possible that maybe these bottles of, of the pills have been sitting in a hot truck oh, for yeah. a while and, you know, that they're um, uh, oxidized. Rancid, oxidized. So um, now on the other hand, we do, we eat a lot of green vegetables. We eat nuts every day, chia seeds, that sort of thing. So we are getting the ALAs as well. Um, I get a, I get a lot of ALA because I eat a lot of green leafy vegetables. Yeah, yeah we do um, that. But um, I'm not sure the EPA and DHA is effectively made at, at my age mm -hmm. from ALA. But well, also, yeah. I haven't tested it. I haven't yeah. gotten a blood test to see what my omega threes levels are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't feel that that's that important. I mean, I'd rather know my APOB level and my LP low A level than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> LPA lipoproteins that. Yeah, li lipoprotein A is an issue for me. Mine runs almost three times the reference range, um, and of course, it's probably mostly genetic. Right. Um, I did see a cardiologist back in 2019 because I. I had just gone through a divorce and it was really stressful at work. This, that, and the other thing. I was getting like relentless uh, palpitations. I mean, oh. just relentless. So I got the full cardiac workup. And um, what the cardiologist said, you know, I'd been on a whole food plant based diet for a while. She said, What you're doing, uh, there's no pill that can do that. You know, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't, I, my, uh, my cholesterol was 330, went down to 143. My triglycerides have always been good. And then I had been pre-diabetic and that completely had cleared up. And she said, what you're doing is better than any medicine. Um, she actually suggested I go on a low dose statin to get my cholesterol down even lower, but I chose not to because my dad died of a, uh, a myopathy that may have been induced by taking well, statins. Yeah. Um, so that kind of scared me off. But I mean, it's very, it's a motivator to really stick to the diet. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, at this point, there's not a heck of a lot you can do about li lipoprotein A specifically, unless maybe you know something you can share with me. Well, I was thinking a PSK9, PSCK9 inhibitor might uh, help with a LP little A. Oh, is that right? Uh, it's, that's my understanding. Now, I don't know because I had mine tested last year. Nobody knew what to do with the levels when I got the test results back. Mm -hmm. So I kind of felt a little silly. Um, and, you know, what we do right now in terms of trying to, to um, we do time-restricted uh, eating right now, which helps, that helps my hunger. Because mm -hmm. I know what I've done is I've trained myself 
our last meal is a, usually about 5 30 5 to mm -hmm. 5 30. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. this whole thing about when you eat during the day makes a huge difference in your blood sugar response mm -hmm. we've done continuous glucose monitoring i think those are actually kind of dangerous because those people want to keep your glucose under 140 at all times. So they don't want you to have any spikes over 140. Being non-diabetic, I don't see the, the literature that supports that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, it is good to see how my body responds to certain foods in terms of blood sugar responses. Mm -hmm. But I try not to let the continuous glucose monitor affect what I eat, but it is difficult when you got that thing on, you know, it, if you're going to eat a bunch of like oatmeal that spikes my blood sugar really high. Oh, uh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was, it shocked me and it scared me. <laughs> so I quit eating it. And, you know, and then the more I learned about the continuous glucose monitors, the more I decided yeah, I want this information, but I'm not going to let it affect what I eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that that's interesting. Um, just now, just to backpedal a little bit. So you um, needed your knee done, but you'd had this history of pretty bad heart disease. What did they say about you uh, getting the surgery? Did they were did I they want to? That. Yes. So I, I called my cardiologist at the time and said I'm going to have a knee replacement. His response was, well, we have to do another arteriogram. And if I see anything, I'm going to stent it. And this is like, um, this sounds like I made this up. Literally, I was at lunch the next day. And I reluctantly said, okay, let's schedule this thing for Friday. This was a Tuesday. I was at lunch with my assistant and my phone dinged. And I looked at it. And it said, new meta-analysis reveals stenting asymptomatic heart disease just increases your risk of having a heart attack. Right. And, yep. and so I immediately called my wife and said, I think I just got a message from God. Mm -hmm. um, she called Dr. Esselstyn. Now, at this time, Dr. Esselstyn didn't know me from Adam. Mm. And he returned my phone call. We spent about 45 minutes on the phone. At the time, I thought he returned the phone call because I had MD behind my name. Mm -hmm. But I now know he calls people all over the world, actually, and talks to them. Um, that's what prompted me to go to Cleveland, actually. I felt mm -hmm. like since he spent 45 minutes on the phone with me, I at least needed to go see him and develop a doctor-patient relationship. And so he then became my doctor for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, he, he's, he was a general surgeon, so I don't, he's very dogmatic <laughs> and I'm convinced he could eat paper and be okay with it, <laughs> but he's not a foodie. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, I mean, I spent four hours on the phone a few months ago with a guy that Esselstyn had, basically offended because the guy was losing weight so quickly. And Dr. Essie said, well, I've never had anybody just blow away. And so he just wasn't concerned with his weight loss. This guy was into under 140 and he's five foot 10. Oh, yeah. And so I convinced him to start eating some nuts, go against Essie in that yeah. regards. Yeah. Or you can eat uh, like avocados and um, right. uh, dates, you know, pretty high calorie. Um, avocados yeah, that's just, are great. I, we eat a lot of avocados as well. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's a that's a se no no. So he doesn't yeah. want you to have any avocado. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and he readily agrees that the science supports eating nuts. He just mm -hmm. he says I've done this, and I'm my concern is if I give an inch, people will take a mile, and I understand yeah. that too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're very calorie dense. It's easy to overeat on them. But uh, just for our listeners, uh, the, the concern with the stenting is uh, if you're asymptomatic, they don't really work better than just medical therapy. And the other thing is the stent itself can become a nidus to, to promote narrowing in some circumstances. Right. Yeah. Um, so they can actually cause problems. Um, 
But uh, I, I made the mistake of going on PubMed and looking up the results of uh, bypass. Oh yeah. So I found a 2005 article in circulation that basically said you have 43% failure rate after 12 to 18 months. And if that bypass fails, you're 10 times more likely to die and 10 times more likely to have a heart attack. And when I read that, um, I immediately did not want to have bypass surgery. I read that, mm -hmm. I looked that article up that uh, Tuesday when I'd read Essie's book. I got on PubMed and started saying, okay, I need to verify some of this stuff. And um, I was shocked at that article. I mean, you know, I was a shoulder surgeon. If my shoulder surgeries failed at that rate, I would have been out of business. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the good thing about this is they just bury their mistakes. Right. Yeah. And and my, I mean, you've obviously looked into this deeper than I have, but my understanding, even with, you know, actual surgical bypass, it, it really doesn't do anything to improve mortality. It's really just about uh, improving symptoms, unless, of course, it's like, unless it's like an unstable situation, you know, where it's a crisis. Well, um, only time it, any of that stuff has been shown with the current literature to be helpful is while you're having a heart attack. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's, I understand the thinking. I mean, mm -hmm. I was a surgeon. I know mm -hmm. to, a chance to cut is a chance to cure. That's the right. way we think. Yeah. But, you know, when you're slapped in the face with the harsh statistics like knee surgery, arthroscopy in, in older patients, it just doesn't pan out. Mm -hmm. And if you're 65, your chances of having a success, successful knee scope are pretty low. So to go in there and do what I did to my knee and clean it out to buy time doesn't make sense when you're in your 60s. Yeah, uh, it was funny. I, I just read an MRI the other day, just on Friday, of a 60-something-year-old with knee pain. There was no x-ray to be seen. I mean, there was cartilage loss and the joint effusion, just like sort of raw, exposed bone. And, and I was thinking an x-ray would have answered the question. Um, you know, what, whether, whether he's got a little bit of a tear in his meniscus or what, it was almost a moot point. Yeah, almost, you're right. Yeah, you know, he pretty much needs a knee replacement. But, but before we get into the connection between orthopedic diseases and, and nutrition, which I know you have some very interesting thoughts on, just to backtrack a little bit, are there any other supplements to consider if you're on a whole food plant-based diet? Vitamin B12 probably is the number one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, and B12 efficiency can be pretty uh, bad and also create permanent problems. Yeah. So uh, we take B12. Um, I do take some other supplements, some of this anti-aging stuff that we've done. I can't say that it's either here nor there. I don't know yet, but mm -hmm. um, one of the supplements that I take is glutathione, which I, for me has made a big difference in how my body uh, feels and reacts to oh, things. Oh, really? I, I, I thought that the problem with glutathione is like it wasn't all that absorbable by mouth. <clears throat> It's not. We give ourselves shots. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah, I get a sub Q shot uh, five times a week. Uh, Is that right? They have some liposomal uh, glutathione, but it's like $2 a pill. I mean, it's oh. pretty expensive. Now, mm -hmm. the injectable stuff's not cheap either, but, um, you know, I've had problems with high blood pressure my whole life. Mm -hmm. That really wasn't controllable on antihypertensives. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, a couple of years ago I had COVID and I had a hypertensive crisis with it. My blood pressure was 244 over 144 oh, wow. at 530 one morning. So I called my cardiologist, who's my friend, <laughs> woke him up and um that I had a CT uh, arteriogram of both my chest and my abdomen. He was looking for kidney issues and that kind of stuff with that blood pressure response to the COVID like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's where I discovered. So previously, I'd had a CT scan, I think around 2011, that showed uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, mm -hmm. which makes sense with triglycerides that high and cholesterol that high. I mean, yeah. that goes hand in hand. <laughs> um, but my scan a couple of years ago showed that that had completely resolved. Yeah. I would expect that with the switch to the whole food plant based diet. I see fatty liver all the time. At yeah, least yeah. every every fourth patient, at least has it on a scan. I feel like a broken record. I don't know if the doctors, you know, when they see that in the report, if they actually address it with the patients or not. Um, yeah. But it's a real. I think a harbinger of really serious. I don't, I don't think mine was addressed at all. Mm hmm. Yeah. I don't even yeah. remember any mention of it by. Yeah, I don't. I think it, I'm was the only one that placed significance on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just yeah. and what did you notice with the glutathione? Like, did it? How did it help you? It, my blood pressure. I mean, so my blood pressure. If I take that stuff regularly, my blood pressure is like a hundred over seven. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, uh, and you know, it tends to be tends to want to go really, really high. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I've had a couple of episodes where it's been over 200. Oh, it's wow. Just, and and what do you mean? I'm, I'm just totally picking your brain because you've had such uh, dramatic results. What sort of a um, intermittent uh, fasting regimen do you routinely do? So do we, um, I basically cut out breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, so when I wake up, I drink a lot of water. Uh, I want to work out fasted. Mm -hmm. So my workouts are in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and so around noon, I do a drink mm -hmm. of um, it's some fibers. It's processed in that it is fiber, but uh, I do a, a, a this stuff called athletic green with it mm -hmm. yeah. to add some and I do that just to kind of, I do it for the fiber to help mm -hmm. my gut more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Glucomannan uh, mm -hmm. is a fiber compound that mm -hmm. actually is probably a great way to lose weight. I don't take it for this way, but it is one of those uh, fibers that is fermentable. So it gets the proper bacteria. Um, mm -hmm. We do acromancia as well, which is a probiotic. I'm not familiar it, with that. It's supposed to uh, provide the, it's acromancia mucinophilia. It provides the mucin for your uh, intestinal protection. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it helps prevent leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Um I've had, I've had gut issues my whole life. Um, I used to have horribly bad reflux, mm. which also went with having really bad triglycerides and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all kinds of other problems. Mm -hmm. um, when I ran track in college, I had to take an antacid every, every day. Oh, uh, really? Oh. They, track, for some reason, gave me horrible heartburn. Is that right? Uh were you a sprinter? I was a quarter miler, so kind of in betweener. Yeah, uh, that's 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 really odd. I would never have expected that. I was just going to speculate that maybe as a sprinter, like that really hard exertion would maybe get you know, like sometimes weightlifters will get reflux. Right. Uh, but who I don't know. It, it probably the, had to do with what I was eating too at the time. Yeah, I was yeah, extremely meat centric. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was the guy that would. Um, just eat meat. Mm -hmm. So you're probably not a fan of the carnivore uh, craze. It's um, interesting that another orthopedic surgeon really promotes that. Mm -hmm. um, I investigated it because I didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no way he does what he says he does, or at least mm -hmm. what I heard him say on the Joe Rogan show. 
which was he only eats meat. I uh, went on to a website and pulled up his uh, meal plans. Mm -hmm. And basically it's uh, low starch vegetables that he eats along with meat. Mm -hmm. nice. uh, but in my reading, I think one of the most important things that we, the number one in, uh, nutrient we don't get enough of is fiber. Now, in, right. in the United States, 97% yes. of us are fiber yep. deficient. Yep, yep. Um, yep. And there's a lot of magic in fiber. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It changes so health. many things. Yeah. And, yeah. The, uh, you know, that particular orthopedic surgeon, I remember I saw at least part of that Joe Rogan podcast, and he was talking about some of his blood work. It was totally abnormal. You know, he was pre-diabetic. His testosterone was low. Um, uh, I think his renal function might have been impaired. And he was giving all of these convoluted explanations for about why it was okay. But, you know, I think the thing is with the carnivore diet is that, that you have a lot of GI sensitivity issues or whatever, and, and, and you go on this diet, and when you do that, you're eating nothing but meat and or maybe a little bit of vegetables. You know, you've eliminated those 42% of processed carbohydrates that the average American is consuming. So the right. net effect is in the short term, there might be some benefit. You might feel better. I but think that you doesn't do. mean get rid of that processed food. Yeah. So that doesn't mean, though, that you're not building a plaque at an accelerated rate and then you're going to feel fine until you drop dead. Exactly. And, you know, we know what causes heart disease. I mean, it's yeah. not a mystery. Yeah. Um, saturated fat and LDL um, mm -hmm. with the lipoproteins mm -hmm. um, basically set the whole cascade in motion. Yeah. Um, so. In my mind, I'm pretty simplistic. My thing is, hey, if saturated fat really is one of the culprits, quit eating saturated fat. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't even like to eat coconut because it's a lot of saturated fat. Yeah. Uh, and we were doing a um, fasting mimicking by Walter Longo. Mm -hmm. That's actually how I started down the fasting pathway. Mm -hmm. Is fasting so intrigued me, but so scared me mm -hmm. that um, Walter Longo uh, is at USC and a, a longevity researcher and came out with a diet that he calls the fasting mimicking diet. And it's mm -hmm. 11 to 1200 calories the first day. And then for the next four days, you get about 700 calories of plant based, higher fat low carb so the vegetables are non-starchy veggies and nuts and seeds okay uh and he has research that shows that if you do this your body thinks it's in a fast state so then you start doing all the the you, you start down the pathways that fasting is so healthy so you, your autophagy starts to kick in and the reasons that we want to be fasted uh, start kicking in with this fasting mimicking diet. He has studies that if you do this one, five days, uh, five days, once a month for three months, that it then resets your stem cells. Oh, and so is that right? your body starts then making new younger stem cells. Hmm. Hmm. That's this interesting. research is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I have read a bit about that. Now, um, when you're not doing the fasting mimicking diet, so you, you skip breakfast, and then you have this shake at noon, do you just have one main meal a day? Or what do you do? Correct. Right now, yeah. And do you know so how that one main meal, meal, we want it, you know, like, last night, we had uh, my wife made tofu chicken, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, baked. Yeah. <laughs> So and not really no. a big uh, coal, a, it was almost like a slaw, had oh. all this different cabbage in it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and pinto beans. So that's what I had last night. Yeah. And so how many calories do you figure you're getting? I don't to... even, I don't, I don't, I don't even look at it. I yeah. have no okay. idea. Are you, 
I, I, I just go by my weight. Yeah. If my weight, if I maintain my weight and I'm very active, I fear I'm eating enough. Mm -hmm. The other mm -hmm. things I go by is my, are my fingernails growing and is my hair falling out mm -hmm. in terms of protein mm -hmm. and whether or not I can actually build muscle. Yeah. So do you have a lot of hunger on that regimen? No, because I've trained myself not to. Oh, okay. Okay. I guarantee hunger is such a mind game. So that, that, that time I went on that eight day water only fast, I, I found out I couldn't watch TV. I don't watch a lot of TV, but you know, every commercial is a hamburger commercial. And yeah, right. When you're not eating, that stuff looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's something I've been dying to ask you about. Um, uh, I saw a video that you did. You went way out on a limb, said something that I was not familiar with about the connection between diet and common orthopedic diseases. Well, yeah, there's no question that most of what we deal with from a musculoskeletal standpoint is diet related. Uh, 1965, there's a study published that basically demonstrated that rotator cuff tears start uh, in an area of the cuff with the porous blood supply. Mm -hmm. And we always call those watershed areas. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the elbow, lateral epicondylitis. Um, the tendon attachment doesn't have great blood supply. So you get a little tear. It's really hard to heal. And as much as I hate to admit it, life is about blood flow. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to always have this conversation with my cardiology con uh, colleagues that the heart existed to put blood to the bones, but mm. there's a, other reasons. <laughs> uh, and it is a blood vessel born problem. Um, mm -hmm. I did a deep dive into what caused rotator cuff tears and I was shocked when I, had this eureka moment where I thought, well, a rotator cuff tear is a heart attack of the shoulder hmm. because all the exact same cytokines are involved. As a matter of fact, the way you uh, lay plaque down in an artery is actually the way you heal bone. Again, the same cytokines are involved. Huh. Uh, huh. It's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, I had this moment where I went, wow, rotator cuff tear and heart disease is essentially the same thing. Uh, That's and then I went, I literally said to myself, you idiot, biological systems are very efficient. And so we wouldn't devise some way to try and fix an injury and then some other completely different way. So it makes sense that, yeah, we use the same mechanisms pathologically that we do physiologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and rotator cuff tear is a pathologic condition. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, 50% of us by the age of 70 had full thickness rotator cuff tears and are totally asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was very frustrating treating rotator cuff disease because you don't treat a normal uh, structure. You're treating something very abnormal and trying to make it normal, and it's very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. The literature, uh, the rate of retear from rotator cuff repair ranges from 3% to 97% in the literature. Oh, so wow. it's all over the board. Yeah. But yeah. it's not a great healing environment because it, it develops in a an environment that has poor blood supply as its main cause. Now, are you aware of any data uh, supporting an improved diet and uh, improvement of uh, rotator cuff symptoms? No, I, I, I don't know of any study that's been done like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having a rotator cuff symptom is pretty common. Yeah. Um, I've been dealing with one in my left shoulder for over a year now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think what I did was uh, tore my Terry's minor doing some real rigorous swimming oh, that's, maneuvers. That's less common than the other rotator muscle, muscles. 
Correct. And that's what's uh, baffled me because my yeah. pain in my shoulder and the area that's swollen is in the back of the shoulder. And, you know, it's like I treated patients for, I've been a doctor for 40 years and never saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but leave it to me to come up with something unusual. Yeah. Now, are you, do you speculate on any connections between diet and any other common orthopedic diseases like osteoarthritis? Oh, yeah. It, I mean, so it, it has to do with inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, and our inflammatory pathways, um, me personally, when I was in my 30s, I hurt everywhere. You know, I haven't mm -hmm. played college football. I was eating horribly. Uh, and I made the statement that in my 30s that I don't know if I was going to make it through my 40s. Oh, wow. I mean, it was a very painful existence. Uh, horrible back issues, neck issues, I've had neck fusion. I need a two-level back fusion, but there's no way I will have that because mm -hmm. those don't work either. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, people... It's shocking how ineffective uh, spine surgery is. Without it's really shocking how ineffective surgery is to me. Yeah. And basically, you know, with a retail rate of three to ninety-seven percent, mm -hmm. it's hard to. We can make we can make that patient feel better, mm -hmm. but they may not have an intact cuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, shoulder pain is hard to live with. Yeah. It's everything. Yeah. I mean, I actually, my shoulder's a little bit sore right now too. Just, you know, one out of 10 right now, but I've had issues all my life and I've, I've learned to sort of manage it with, you know, exercises for the rotator cuff uh, and, you know, careful choice of exercise and so on. Um, uh, now, one thing, you know, I've always, I've always wondered about, like I've done a lot of joint injections over the years as a radiologist and there's no question, like people get better. Um, and usually it's a temporizing uh, strategy until they get their, you know, hip replacement or whatever. Right. But, um, you know, given that you're putting steroid in and suppressing inflammation, you, it'd be interesting to know that if you decrease inflammation in their body through diet, it would actually improve the symptoms of their osteoarthritis. Oh, it, it did in me. Tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting to have a trial on that. Yeah. Um, it, inflammation, though, is so variable. In terms of, it's kind of like nutrition, you know, because so here's what I've learned. So my microbiome puts out a metabolome mm -hmm. and that can change based on how I'm feeling emotionally mm -hmm. will change my metabolome. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that I think makes nutrition research difficult because mm -hmm. you can't lock everybody up in a war. <laughs> not, not for too and, long. Yeah. And really, you know, prescribe it. So, and so I may eat something one day that I don't get inflamed with, but it may be because I'm in a happy state of mind when I'm eating mm -hmm. and I may be conflicted and thinking about something that's got me upset and if I eat in that environment, I'll have a different metabolome. I'll have different metabolites in my body from mm -hmm. the same bacteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I know now about our hunger is our microbiome is communicating with our brainstem. Mm -hmm. So it's not even going to the higher cortical areas. That communication is going, and there's nine times more information going from the gut to the brain than from the brain to the gut. Oh, wow. And so, you know, that vagal nerve that serves a huge purpose, and most of it is opposite of what I thought. Same thing with the heart. There's more neural information going from your heart to your brain than from your brain to your heart. Wow. They call that your heart brain. My gut yeah. brain and my heart brain can completely override my cortex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this communication is going on all the time through metabolites, through neurotransmitters, through short chain fatty acids. There are all these different communication chemicals 
that's going on. And I'll, I saw it in my office all the time. People would mindlessly eat and they wouldn't even know what they're doing mm -hmm. it's because their cortex wasn't engaged. Right. It's right. just this communication from the microbiome to your brainstem saying, hey, I'm craving this or mm -hmm. I want such and such. And then if I cave to that crave, then my microbiome starts that craving even more because mm. it wants that that quick fix. It yeah. wants that high sugar food or high fat food. We're driven to that stuff. We mm. wouldn't have survived as a species. Right. I mean, we survive better by eating, you know, high cal calorie uh, foods when they're available. And but of course, they weren't available in a junk food form. Correct. Uh, yeah, and they weren't yeah. available that often either. Right, right. I mean, I mean maybe could, the sweetest, sweetest thing might be kill a big or... antelope and five or six of us just gorge on that thing. But we might not eat again for three or four days. Right. Or if we right. came across honey, we could just gorge ourselves on honey. There's no satiation with honey. Yeah, yeah. And that's if a food is reinforcing, mm -hmm. and that means habit forming, mm -hmm. uh, it is not satiating. Mm -hmm. The most satiating food tested is a potato. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, who knew, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. True. yeah. So, uh, I, I tried to use some of that knowledge to help with my fight with hunger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so, and if I, yeah. if I'm during the day, if I feel like I'm getting hungry, I'll have a couple of nuts. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have, um, back in Oklahoma, we have jars of nuts and shells. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't like shelled nuts because they're too easy to overeat. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, my pecans and walnuts are in shells. So I have mm -hmm. to crack them and get them out and eat them. Um, but I've, I've developed these strategies because I know my addictive mind wants food and wants it right now. Mm -hmm. But it's a well, what I do with the nuts is we keep a like a one quarter cup thing in the jar of the shelled mixed nuts. So I just have like one scoop uh, once a day, and I figure yeah. that that's the right amount. Um, but you know, it's these relationships are really fascinating. Like I mentioned. A, few, a number of years ago, I was having those issues with these relentless palpitations. Well, they did the big workup on me and left no stone unturned. Well, it was just purely stress. It was just wow. pure stress. And they, they just faded away. And, you know, I, I, I don't get them anymore. Um, but it's amazing that connection between the mind and, and the body, um, you know, how tight that link is. But, uh, well, we've been talking for over an hour. It's been a great conversation. Uh, oh, I wasn't even aware of what we've been talking yeah, about. Yeah. Um, it's been a great conversation, and uh, um, you delved into some po fine points I wasn't quite aware of. So uh, I really enjoyed it, and hopefully we can do it again sometime. Sure. My pleasure. I'll talk food whenever. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Yeah.